So we are looking at the book of Romans. <clears throat> the book of Romans is a very interesting book. Uh, it looks like uh, Paul wrote it uh, 10 years before his death. Uh, he was planning to go to Rome, uh, but uh, he couldn't at that moment. Uh, we know that finally he will end up in Rome. So, uh, but we read last time greetings, introduction, explanation, his explanation that he wanted to come to church, that he wanted to come and to, so that they can uh, uh, strengthen one another, so that they can be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. This is his desire. We saw that Paul needs encouragement as well. So, and he wanted to have fellowship with those Christians in Rome. And also, uh, he says that he's not ashamed of the gospel, uh, for it is uh, the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So he's not ashamed of the gospel. He's not ashamed to talk about Jesus' death on the cross. And if you talk about Jesus' death on the cross, it as if you are preaching, uh, well, believe in this guy who was uh, uh, executed, what do you say, electric or electrical chair? Electric. Electric, electric chair. So it's electric chair, right? So you raise. <laughs> Both are bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's something, it's a symbol of execution, right? So mm -hmm. this is what you think. And cross is exactly the same. So that is why, but Paul is not ashamed, you know. He is not ashamed uh, to preach someone who was crucified, right? Uh, because he knows that uh, he was, uh, Jesus was raised from the dead. So now, <clears throat> let us think about something here. Uh, he says, uh, it's uh, po the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So it's the whole world, uh, to the Jew first and uh, also to the Greek. Uh, so we see that the gospel is not just for Jews, but also for the Greeks. This is something new because uh, Jews uh, originally believed that the Messiah is only for them. And uh, first Christians are all Jews, and there are some Christians among Jews back then who believe that it's for us. Only Jews can be Christians. So the Apostle Paul, he's a Jew, but he is called, you know, the Apostle of the Gentiles, right? He's preaching to non-Jews, to the Gentiles, right? And they are called here Greek. <coughs> Greek, it's not just nationality. It's anybody who is not a Jew who speaks, you know, the Greek language, right? So uh, this is huge, that the gospel is now also for the Greeks, you know, for Americans, for, you know, Germans, for the French, for English, right? For Indians. Moldavian. Huh? Moldavian. Moldavian, yeah, the, not to miss us, right? Yes, uh, the Chinese, right, to all the people. So that is, that is, that is very important. Now, uh, we need to understand that the Messiah is coming in the, co in the context of the people of Israel and their history and their law. All the Jews, they were familiar with the law of Moses. When you are born, they will teach you, right? So what to observe, you know, they will teach you. Uh, the Ten Commandments. Now, the Greek, uh, they didn't have all that background. They, when they are born, uh, they would just see all kinds of gods and idols and their own rituals. And very often they are not very, you know, it's not about, they are not moral, you know. Uh, they, most of those things are immoral, right? Most of those things would be like, you know, human sacrifice or sexual immorality, you know, all kind of things uh, li like that. So now, <clears throat> Romans, uh, they are not Jews. Romans do not have any Jewish background. So now, how do you explain to someone who's not a Jew uh, God's plan of salvation? Where do you start? Where do you start? So the first 
point would be to explain to them that you are a sinner. Well, there is a God, there is God's law, and you're a sinner. Why you are a sinner? I mean, when I preach to people who are not Jews, uh, non-believers, and I tell them they, they are a sinner, they say, no, no, I didn't kill anybody. So I'm not a sinner. I didn't kill anybody, you know, and because, or you know, I don't steal, or you know, I don't. So this is people kind of think about those two things, like stealing and killing. If you didn't that, you are not a sinner. But then you see that when you preach to them more, you show that they lied somewhere, they were not honest, and so on and so forth, right? When you analyze their life a little bit, you know, longer in detail, you will see they will see that they are actually sinners, right? So now, <clears throat> uh, Paul, he begins with God's law. He begins with the idea that we all are sinners and we need a Savior. Because if you are not a sinner, then you don't need a Savior. So, do you agree with this? Uh, do you see that? Like, first you need to say, well, okay, Jesus is a Savior, okay. But I'm not a sinner. I, I, I don't have a problem. You need to show them that they have a problem. And this is what he does. Uh, he says, God's wrath on unrighteousness. He talks about God's wrath. So what is God's wrath? There is God who created this universe, and he has a perfect uh, moral law. Because he is holy, right? He's holy, and he has this perfect moral law, God's law. So when we break that law, so then we are supposed to be punished. And we know that the wages of sin is death, right? So the, everybody breaks God's law. So that is why everybody deserves to be punished by death. So now Paul talks about this in terms of wrath. God's wrath. But God is not uh, unstable uh, 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 maniac, right? So who's, who's angry? God is angry. So, and now, because when you look at the uh, pagan gods, Roman gods, Greek gods, Babylonian gods, gods of the nations around Israel, they are like crazy maniacs. They can get angry just like because of nothing. They're jealous, you know, Zeus, who Greeks worshipped, whom Greeks worshipped. He sees uh, a woman and he wants to rape her, you know, and he rapes her. You know, this is, this is, these are ancient gods, you know. They're evil and they see someone and they don't like someone and they just send all kinds of bad things in their lives, you know. They're just like really evil gods, capricious. So now, Paul explains that the God of the Bible is loving God, is kind God, is perfect God, okay? So he's not capricious. But because he's holy, when you break his law, there is punishment. There is wrath of God that is coming to you because of that, right? It's not, uh, it's not uh, he, he, he doesn't play favorites. When you see the history of the Old Testament, you see that Israel is called God's people, but the moment they abandon God or rebel against God, God punishes them like anybody else. So he doesn't play favorite. He's absolutely just. Okay? So now if we have this law, perfect law, that we all cannot keep, and as a result of that, God's punishment comes on us, what is our solution? How can we be saved? So we need the Savior. We need Jesus, right? So now what happens, God's plan is that Jesus, who is sinless, he dies on the cross. He takes upon himself all our sins, the sins of all humanity, the curse of the law, right? And then the wrath of God, which is the law. The law kills him on the cross. This is a big question. What kills Jesus on the cross? 
it's the law of God. Why the law of God kills Jesus on the cross? Because Jesus has on him all the transgressions and sins of humankind. Did Jesus deserve to be killed? No. He made this decision to die in our place. He takes upon himself all those you know, sins and curses to die in our place. So now this is what Paul is trying to describe. You know, well, there is this wrath of God, which is not, it's not crazy. God is absolutely fair. This is his nature. He's holy. And there is this wrath on all the people, on everyone, because we all break his law. And first he will be talking about the wrath of God, and then he will be talking about Jesus in his epistle, right? So having said that, let us, let, let us read. Uh, uh -huh. Yes, sure. So Paul was Roman. Is he a Roman? Uh, he was a Jew, but he was a Roman citizen. He, he was Roman by descent? Or... Uh, uh, he was a Jew by descent. He was a Pharisee. But he was a Roman, he had Roman citizenship. Okay. Paul is originally from Asia Minor. The, his his uh, hometown is called Tarsus. He is a Jew from the tribe of Benjamin. And he is uh, wealthy. He is coming from a wealthy family. And he was born as a Roman citizen. So is it fair to say that this was a homecoming of sorts for him? He never was in Rome. Oh, I thought he did visit Rome. No, no. It's like you, uh, uh, have you visited Washington, D.C.? I have. <laughs> Another. Huh? Another. <laughs> who, hasn't, who hasn't visited Washington, D.C.? Okay, yeah, so which means, but you're still American. So you're American citizen, although you didn't, Rome is the capital. I mean, he just was born, you know. The Roman Empire expands way beyond the city of Rome. That's right, that's right. The reason I was asking is, is it, this struck me after our last session, and I was just wondering if he had more intimate knowledge of who the Romans actually were and what they were about because he was from... I think he knew because he lived under the Romans, but he himself is a Jew okay. who is from the tribe of Benjamin. Right. And he, he says... he, he he, he, in one of his epistles, he kind of gives this information to us. And by the way, that explains why he is Saul. Uh, because Paul is his uh, Roman name, but his Jewish name is Sheol, or Saul. We say Saul, right? And Saul is King Saul. And King Saul is, Tatiana saw that connection at some point, and so, King Saul is from the tribe of Benjamin as well. And Paul is from the tribe of Benjamin. And people, it's a small tribe. And people from this tribe, they would call their children Saul because of the first king, Saul. So, yeah, he's, he's, he's a Jew, but with Roman citizen. Thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, so, uh, about God's wrath. 18. 18. Mm -hmm. Who would like to read it for us? <laughs> So one day, for us Christians, we need to be so happy to wait that day. We need to desire to be in that day, to, but not under God's wrath. But we need to understand that we have Jesus. But it's so good that God has uh, Lord and has commandments. It may, David said, I love your uh, I, I love your commandments. So, so you know, and one day, when I was uh, okay. cured by and, people, uh, by so uh, some of the circumstances in my life, I was looking for God, and I was thinking <coughs> about that. So if God exists, it means ju uh, justice. Exists. And I wanted his uh, uh, judge. Judgment. Judgment. I wanted that. And when he came to my life, when he showed that he exists, I was so happy because I knew he controls everything. And he knows what is fair, what is unfair, and how to punish these people, not to punish. But I knew that God has these rules, laws, and you know, and it made me so happy. But 
This is the the, this is this is very good this is very good point the law of god is not bad although it kills unrighteousness you're right it's good so and, and in the scripture some people th th this is this is very good emphasis because some people are angry that god has law you know, because, well, he, I cannot live my life as I want, you know, and he punishes me. And this is absolutely different approach, what you described, not, not common approach to God's law. So when you love God's law, when you understand that it is holy, and yes, it is holy, it's God's will, it's good. Our problem is that we cannot actually uh, meet the demands of this law. This is our problem. But, the, but it's our problem. Uh, it's problem with us, not with the law of God. So, who would like to read it for us? Well, Jeff. Uh, okay, uh, Kelly. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Kelly. Okay. Um, so we're in Romans 1.18. Right? Mm -hmm. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. And the things that have been made... J just a second. Let us pause here for a second. This is natural theology. He says here that, yeah, Jews, they have special revelation from Moses about God and the Ten Commandments. But what about the Gentiles? What about the Romans who don't have, you know, the Bible? Well, through creation, natural theology, they can actually come to the conclusion that God exists, right? And just thinking about themselves and what is good, what is right, they can reach the same conclusion, what is, what is good, what is right. Without special revelation, written revelation, the Bible, people who are not Jews, who are not Christian, they still can understand what is right, what is God, good, and then uh, uh, in chapter 2, the law is written on the hearts of Gentiles. So even without the revelation, they still can understand what is right, what is bad. And, you know, a good example of, of that would be like, uh, say, Aristotle and his Nicomach Nicomachean ethics, right? So you can see that people before Christ, people who didn't know about Jews, they still, when they thought about, you know, human nature and virtues, they would come to similar conclusion that you need to be honest, that you need to care for others, that there is such thing as honor. And you would think, okay, these people don't know God, they don't know Jesus, and they still are able to think in those terms. And this is what Paul is referring to, that even if you don't have written revelation like Jews, uh, you still can understand what is right, what is good, if you are look if you are interested in that, right? And he says, well, people were able to find, figure that out, but they didn't. They were not interested in that. They no, were not interested in their creator. Okay, can, let us keep reading. So they are without excuse, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their few, foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds, animals, and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Okay, so. And he's talking now about all the nations around them, you know, including Romans, who would have all the statues of all the gods, like Zeus or, you know, Athens, you know, and they would worship them. And some, like in Egypt, they would worship cats or, you know, snakes or, you know, yeah, all those kind of things, right? All kind of figures. So, but then you see that when people choose that, God just leaves them. He just leaves them. They, they don't want to sh worship him. He walks away. Uh, 
that's very that's very interesting. Okay, let us let us continue. And by the way, I found what I wanted to show you. So it's Romans chapter two, verse fifteen, or even fourteen. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, do you see that? Mm -hmm. They are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. He means the law here is the law of Moses. They do not have the Bible in their hands, but they still can understand, right? What is good, what is right. And he explains why. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bear witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of man uh, by Christ Jesus. Okay, so they, they have conscience. So they still can understand what is right, what is good. Okay, now you, if you on purpose rebel against God, which we can see in today's culture as well, right? What happens? God leaves you. And then what happens uh, 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 when you become futile in your thinking, right? It's, uh, we are back in chapter 1, verse 21. They became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. This is what happens. Well, God is the light. You don't want to serve God. You will be in darkness. Uh, and what will happen next, and this is very interesting, next, sexual immorality comes. For some reason, worshiping, you know, idols and, you know, being in darkness always is associated with sexual immorality. And we see that in today's culture as well. You know, how sexual immorality is going hand in hand with uh, anti-God ideology, right? So let, it, let, let us keep reading. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. So this is homosexuality. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such <coughs> things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. So this is the state of the world without God. Right? This is the state of the world that rebels against God. And of course, he later would say, well, you need someone who will save you from this. And this someone is Jesus. And he will be explaining how Jesus saves you. So let us pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for opening our eyes uh, about your law, that your law is holy, is good, and uh, that the world without you is falling into darkness, and uh, we are so glad that you uh, helped us find the light, Jesus, our Savior and Lord. And Jesus, help us, encourage us uh, to stay focused on, on, on you, Jesus. We want to stay focused on you so that our hearts do not get darkened. And uh, we want to share the good news, the gospel, the truth with others so that more and more people may get to know you, repent, um, be born again, and be your children. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.